Hello, everyone. We're almost there. We're almost at discussion. <laughs> My name's Eleanor Bennett. I'm a, a PhD student from the University of Birmingham. Uh, I feel like I need a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm a historian, specifically an Assyriologist. So I look at uh, the Neo-Assyrian period. So I feel like I'm coming at this at kind of the, the reaching towards conflict archaeology uh, that John was mentioning at the very beginning. <laughs> uh, my paper today is called the rather wonderful title, I think, Queens in the Sand, the Problems of Investigating Neo-Assyrian Battles. Uh, I'm going to give you a very brief background of the Neo-Assyrian background how, period. How many people here have heard of Neo-Assyria before now? Oh, good. <laughs> You'll make my life a lot easier. Uh, I'm going to give you the traditional method of what I'm used to when we're discussing these battles. And then I'm going to investigate a future multidisciplinary approach towards these with a case study from my own research. So, the brief background. Uh, the new Assyrian Empire, it uh, stretched, well, it was based in northern Iraq and it was from 934 to 612 BC. That's all the dates I'm going to be mentioning are going to be in BC. Uh, the fullest extent of this empire is in green. So that's all here. But the period that I'm going to be discussing today is, uh, it started off, is this purple area. The main characteristics was it was uh, very militaristic. The king was expected to go on campaign every year, and there was a very sophisticated propaganda machine. So there were uh, personal exploits were uh, written in royal inscriptions that described military, scientific, and building expeditions or exploits, and these were also uh, presented in the reliefs of the royal palaces. We don't really have much actual direct evidence for battles at these at sites. The the most that I know of to to my knowledge, is at a site in uh, in Israel called Lachish. Please tell me if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, here we've seen arrowheads, slingshots, potentially a helmet crest, and the remains of a siege ramp built by Sennacherib's forces when they besieged the city. But other than that, most other sites, we have to rely on the texts and palace reliefs because we just were still very far behind in terms of actually locating them, let alone excavating them. Uh, but something I need to say is that there is a growing movement within my own field to use reliefs oh sorry I'm, I'm way ahead of myself <laughs> uh, so going with the tech with my uh, case study for today uh, it comes under the reign of Tiglath Pileser III so he reigned from 744 till 727 and <coughs> under him there was a massive expansion of the new Assyrian Empire after a period of contraction but his annals were incredibly fragmentary that we have very limited information about what actually happened. But within those annals, we do have mention of a battle with a woman, picking up on the earlier theme of, you know, women in battle, uh, Samsi, queen of the Arabs, and these women are my PhD thesis, basically. Uh, we have more information about this particular battle than any other battle with these queens of the Arabs. So I thought it was a good candidate for a bit of further analysis to see what else I could find out about the battle. So. The traditional approach, the first thing we do is turn to the texts. Uh, the annals are incredibly fragmentary, that's because of poor storage from antiquity, and we don't know the intended audience as well. So we do know there's a particular image and message portrayed. Uh, for example, there's not a single Assyrian defeat mentioned, but we don't know who that message is towards. The annals tend to say that battles happened, but we don't have any detail. So we don't have any information about the tactics, strategies, or even the weapons that are employed. So this is the most intact version of the events of the battle I'm talking about today. It's a wall of text, so I'll walk you through, don't worry. First of all, we know that, that the battle was fought in Mount Sakuri, which is an interesting grammatical point. Uh, then we know that 9,400 Arabs were killed. We know that 1,000 captives, 30,000 camels, 20,000 oxen, and 5,000 bags of aromatics, as well as religious items, were then taken from the Arabs. And then Samsi fled into the desert. Her camp was burned, and her remaining soldiers were taken to the centre of the camp and then slaughtered. And then Samsi surrendered to Tiglath Pileser III, sending camels to Asher as tribute. Asher was the capital city at the time, I believe. They moved their capitals around a lot. Uh, then an Assyrian official was placed over her alongside 10,000 troops to make sure that she stayed under control, basically. After hearing news of her surrender, other leaders, who we think are Arab as well, then sent tribute to Assyria. So this is like other battles in the annals. We, don't, we know the battle happened, but there are no details. So the next step in the traditional approach is to turn to reliefs to supplement some, with some more data from the text. 
The reliefs of Tiglath Pileser III are also fragmentary because of the same reason, poor storage and antiquity, but they do inform us about the armour, weapons and transportation, but we don't have much information about tactics and strategy. So with limited information, where do we go from here? Well, we have to move beyond text and reliefs, that's kind of the whole point here. So I decided to go back to basics and I questioned that the suggested location that's always put forward about Mount Sakuri, which is Jebel Abdruz. Again, apologies for mispronunciations. So this mountain has been suggested because, quite frankly, it's a mountain in the area controlled by the Arabs currently in modern southern Syria. That's pretty much the only reasoning so far people have given for it. But my question is, could the battle have actually physically happened there? And the best way to answer this is to turn to the landscape. So when you look at imagery from, again, historian don't have very fancy, you know, satellite imagery, so I turn to Google Maps. When you look at it from above, the most obvious way to approach the mountain is from either the north or from the south. Also, interestingly, it's a plateau, not a mountain, which was nice to find out. Then I turned to the Helsinki Atlas of the Neo-Syrian Empire, and from there, there are two plausible routes, with the assumption that you need to keep your army supplied whilst you're going along the King's Highway, which is the red lines on the map. The first route is from the mouth, is from the north. Sorry, uh, this is again similar to what the satellite imagery uh, suggests. So here you go along the King's Highway to Damascus. Here it's called Dimashka, uh, and then you head south, stopping at a river and two settlements along the way. The other option is if you if you come to the mountain from the west. So this is not what the satellite suggests. So here you go past Damascus, you follow the rivers until you uh, follow the rivers going south, and then you approach the plateau from the west along one of these rivers. And my question is, are, are these suggestions actually plausible or even possible? So I turned to GIS and uh, I hoped this would answer this. I have to say that these are all preliminary results and I have Chris King to thank for all of these because I'm mostly technologically illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you so much. Uh, this image, oh good, it, it's come up relatively okay, I was worried about that. Uh, it shows the least cost paths from eight points around the plateau to the center. And there's no, there's only small deviations. I was expecting them all to converge either at one end or the other, but there wasn't any real massive deviation. And there's no indication that the terrain would create a massive preference of the Assyrian route. So as a brief conclusion, I'd say that the north, west, and southern approaches were all possible, but I would tend to err towards the Assyrians coming towards the north, coming from the north or the west, due to the, their ability to resupply along the routes there. So my second question was, could the Arabs see the Assyrians' approach? So with this, uh, we took observation points at the average height of a human of 1.73 meters, and we uh, placed them in eight compass points uh, at the edge of the plateau, so they're on the ridge. And again, it's seeming ideal conditions of clear weather, trees, and you can see for infinite distances. Uh, each of these dots represents an Arab scout looking outwards to, for an Assyrian to come in. Um, and I'm also only showing you the, the points where the Arabs can actually see something. <laughs> and working on the previous assumption that the Assyrians are coming in from the north or the west, then I've also focused on those. Uh, and. What you can see is you can see a lot from the north, northeast, west, and southwest. So I, I'm perfectly happy to say that the Arabs could definitely see the Assyrians if they came from the suggested approach to the north or the west, and that the Arabs would definitely have had time to both mobilize their troops and move their camp and any civilian elements to safety. So this particular question was what started my investigation into this battle, which was would, would the armies have fit in this area that we're talking about? Because 9,400 people sounds like a lot of people, and I needed to see if the landscape could actually accommodate these numbers, or if these numbers were inflated in the annals, which is a really common problem in Assyrian inscriptions. So with 9,400 soldiers, there's, there also needs to be space for an Arab camp, camels, the oxen, and the Assyrian army. So again, could all of them fit in the plateau, or would they have, been, have to go on the side of the plateau or in a nearby plain? Well, these are representations of both armies with the numbers that have been given in the text, and the Assyrian army is based on numbers given by Fuchs for the ideal late 8th century Assyrian army. 
And what we can see is there's plenty of space in relation to each other, but there's plenty of space on the plateau to have a huge skirmish. There's plenty of space. I had no need to worry. <laughs> but this aspect doesn't come across in the text. And that's something I really want to stress. It, this isn't mentioned in the text or release, the sheer scale of the area they're discussing. So my conclusion is, as I said, yes, the landscape can accommodate these numbers. And it does also explain the use of the word in to describe where the battle took place as well. So at this preliminary stage, the landscape doesn't really give us much information about the actual battle. I hope to try and explore that with Chris, because again, technologically illiterate. <laughs> But we do have a little bit of information, a little bit of an insight into the immediate aftermath, which is where Samsi flees into the desert. My questions are, where did Samsi flee to? And would she have been able to only see a column of smoke from her burning camp? Or would she have been able to see the Assyrians killing her people? Uh, I find this is really important because this would have influenced both her decision to surrender and her later politics. For uh, in later inscriptions, we know that she sends tribute to a later Assyrian king called Sargon II and that's an indication of friendly relations that have been based on intimidation tactics. So I have two options of where Samsi could have fled to, again, based on her ability to resupply. The first is heading west alongside, along the river, which is potentially the same route as the advance of the Assyrians. So plugging this into GIS and Chris being really useful here. Uh, these are, again, observation points, uh, taking the same height as before, but this time at the bottom of the plateau at eight compass points, looking well, I think these are 360. Yes, th these are 360 degrees. Um, and each one of these dots this time represents Samsi having partially fled on her way to the point that is her ultimate goal and then looking back at the plateau. So I've taken a bit of an assumption that the Arab camp would have been at the highest point in the north. Uh, that, again, is for further investigation and I hope to have some sort of answer. Uh, but I haven't included the southern points because, again, you can't see anything. So in these images, you can see that the northern central part of the plateau is visible from the western points. The second one is she flees into the desert to the east. To so these two small oases is my other plausible thing. I think it's more likely because that's more in line with what the flavour of the Arabs we get in the text. Again, plugging into GIS, uh, we can see that the northern central part of the plateau is, again, visible from the east. So I'm happy to say that Samsi could have fled either east or west, but there's no proof which one is more likely, and she could see a location that may have been where her camp had been. So I'm very cautious with that specific conclusion, but I'm happy to say that she could have seen it, anything from either way. So to sum up, um, I can actually give someone a brief reconstruction of Assyrians approaching a battle, first of all approaching uh, the plateau of Jebel al Druz from either the north or the west, and then Arab scouts being relay relaying this information with enough time to relocate their camp to safety, and then being able to prepare for battle. Uh, the battle was then fought on top of the plateau, and then after the defeat, Samsi fled either east or west, and then surrendered after she saw her people being killed or seeing the smoke from her camp. And I'd like to conclude with the rather grand statement of uh, landscape archaeology, as well as spatial and digital archaeological techniques, are the future of conflict archaeology in ancient Near East battles, especially for people like myself, Assyriologists. So I know I'm on time now. So <laughs> you are well on time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>